Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, heroes and villains. I'm your host, Deshaun Fauntleroy. I know your time is precious, so we're going to get right into today's show. In today's show, the big idea is Julius Shellmeyer. Who is Julius Shellmeyer? Show notes, links, conversation, and more at sportsmastery.com slash 41. As I said before, who is Julius Shellmeyer? What does he do? What is he about? And what makes him special? The first time I met Julius, he was a sophomore in high school, and I had the opportunity to train this young man for about eight months. And from there, I didn't see him again until after his senior season. And as some of you independent strength coaches and personal trainers know, oftentimes there's difficulties in communication between the high school coach and the club coach. So you can't blame an athlete for being loyal to those coaches that they were training with before, even if they don't have advanced training measures or if they don't use programming in their training. Nevertheless, I had to keep my mouth shut because I respected this young man's mother and father. I also respected his brothers and sisters, but I digress. What makes this man special? Well, from the time I've met this young man, he's been very humble outstanding in his work ethic, always the first to show up and the last to leave. And when I first met this young man in high school, I instantly knew from his sophomore season on that I was looking at a future 200 meter champion and 100 meter champion. But I knew that it would take a significant amount of work because oftentimes in the U.S. we have this phrase, don't judge a book by its cover, but we often do. And why do I say that? Because this young man when I met him, he was five foot six, about 130 pounds. Now he's about five foot seven, maybe about pushing 150. So it's not like he's six foot five, six foot four, 220 pound sprinter. He's a different kind of a character. He has a big heart. He has a diligent work ethic. So at the end of the day, when he finished his high school career, Part of our predictions were met, but I also felt that he would be in a place that where he could run somewhere between a 10.57 and a 10.62 didn't happen. Not my problem, but I had to figure out all the hows and the whys and help him get to that. His state best during his senior season in the 200 was 21.72. His 100 meter time was 10.73. As I said before, I always felt he had the capabilities to run somewhere between a 10.57 and a 10.62 as a senior. Didn't happen. Not my concerns. What I did do is when we had a, the chance and the opportunity to work together after his senior season, I had to take some measures to achieve those results. What are some of the reasons for his current success? Well, what I found before, and that still happens today amongst high school and youth coaches, is they want to they want to have this complete recipe for developing the sprinter. But oftentimes they leave out two key ingredients. One is strength training and the other is explosive plyometrics, depending on the age and the maturity of the individuals. Maybe it'll be regressions to basic jump training. Nevertheless, when we started working together, I started pairing his sprint training with strength training and explosive plyometrics. The other thing that I added to is training. And if you know me, you know, oftentimes you can come in the weight room or you can come out to the track and it'll look like a video production set because I would often take the Canon camera out, the iPhone, the iPad, the Sony cam, even the flip cam to get all of the best angles as I could with our sprint training and some odd angles. I didn't want to miss a thing. More importantly, I always timed our workouts with the free lap timing gate system. So that provided an electronic start and it also provided an electronic finish. So all the training that we did was very, very objective. One thing that I don't do is I don't record times with the stopwatch because oftentimes athletes can get a jump on your hand based on your reaction time. And we also have arbitrary finishes where we might hit the stop button too soon or too late. Amateurish move. And the thing about this scenario is I really felt 
that he could achieve certain goals during his high school season, but the strength training wasn't met, the jump training wasn't met, and even if they were approached, they weren't done the proper and correct way. Now, what do I mean by that? What I'm saying is this. If you're high school or if you're a club coach and you're working with advanced, what I mean at this point in time, high school athletes and those athletes that happen to be outliers, they should be introduced to a quality and safe strength training program. There should be filming of the training session at all times. You should be using an electronic timing gate system to where you have an electronic start and electronic finish. That is how you do justice to your athletes. These are some small details that I often see overlooked. And the paradox of all this is that I'm not a high school sprints coach. I don't coach a club track and field team. I played football. That was my sport in college. I was able to work out with the track team for a couple seasons at uh, at Western Oregon University, but I never competed. However, I was always that athlete that ran a 4.7 or a 4.8. And I knew that I would get into coaching one day and that I would coach and teach speed. And all my research going back to the book Super Training and West Side Barbell and some of the other great books out there, they all explain that at a certain point, You have to get stronger to get faster. That leads me to let you know in the show notes, I have a brilliant PDF called Breaking the Speed Barrier in which I recorded, journal, turned into a Word document and had a graphic designer make it look fancy and pretty for you to make it become an interesting read. So check that out in the show notes, Breaking the Speed Barrier. And essentially what I am espousing debating or arguing in the material is genetically you can you're going to get to a point to where you can only move your limbs so fast at that point you're going to reach a wall a ceiling or what I call the barrier so the title of this is breaking the speed barrier and the theme it is all themed around the strength training and resistance training that we were doing at the time so at a certain point you have to get stronger to get faster I'm talking about a guy that made some tremendous sacrifices with his social life, family, friends, relationships to get to his goals. You know, what makes this gentleman special is that I spotted talent and an outlier from the time that I met him based off of his work ethic, his humbleness and his willing to show up day after day. So I knew that we had something. Now, if I was a talent identifier, I would put this guy in a superstar and elite level, even at such a young age, based off those things that I mentioned earlier. Oftentimes we overlook things because in America we're looking for right now versus developing talent over the long haul and getting them to where they're supposed to be in progressions over time. Now, with Julius, I also found that. If I was going to be the guy trusted with his training, I didn't want to be irresponsible for not pushing him far enough. He handled that well. I'll get into some examples later on in the discussion. Now, outside of that, is he the most genetically gifted? No, he's only five foot seven, probably weighs about 145 to 150 pounds right now, maybe a little heavier. But what makes him unique is it comes down He wants it more than anybody that he's training with. He wants it more than anybody on his team because I trained a few of his fellow high school athletes. Now, it's not a knock against them, but right now, Julius is at at the University of Oregon. I know one of the other guys is running at Lane Community College and the other gentlemen, all good kids, all in school, but they did not have the drive that Julius has. And if you looked at the other two, they were genetically more gifted. I would argue that. So what happened in his senior year? He won state in the 200 meters. His best time that year was 21.72 and the hundred meters. He came up short, got second with the 10.73. No problem. We connected in the summer after his uh, senior season in which what came out of that senior season was an academic and athletic scholarship to Southern Oregon University. So this was a time where we had a chance to connect for about eight long weeks over the summer. I paired his sprint training with strength training and jump training. And this was all to get him prepared to be an elite sprinter at the NAI level in Southern Oregon University. 
But I explained to him, in order for us to do that, you have to commit to the weight room. With you being small at 5'7", 140 pounds, we have to get you stronger, and that's going to help you get out of the blocks. That's going to help you hold your top end speed. But we need to get you stronger. So I got a diligent commitment from him to work out of the weight room on a consistent basis where we were training anywhere from four to six times a week. What made this training unique at the time is that I was able to find some training partners. One of his training partners competed at the University of Cincinnati and had transferred to the University of Oregon at the time. I also had some local high school sprinters that played as rabbits for him. So we had some intense competitive training sessions with hungry competitors. We had some great training sessions that eventually prepared Julius to go down and attend school and compete at Southern Oregon University. I think the biggest thing about the summer after his senior season was his commitment to the weight room and the benefits that we got from that. And what do I mean by that? Again, what I do is when I'm timing athletes, I use the free lap timing gate system. So we get an electronic start and we get an electronic finish. I don't use stopwatches. What I have to say about high school coaches, any high school coach or youth coach worth their salt and who is not using an electronic timing gate system for an electronic start, an electronic finish, or filming their athletes to show them on the iPad, iPhone, whatever phone that you might have or camera device to let the athletes see what's going on in real time, you're fired. Your head is metaphorically at the gallows because you're doing your athletes an injustice when you're not taking all of the details and going out of your way to help them become the best athletes that they can be. Now, again, what aided in his success is using cameras, using electronic timing gate systems. And I was fortunate enough to have some outstanding mentors that provided me with spreadsheets and formulas to where I could measure this guy's limb length in centimeters plug that into a spreadsheet and get the exact number in terms of where that front foot should be from the line and where the back foot should be from the front foot. And from there, I could take his femur length and put that in to the formula and get where that first strike should land on up to 100 meters and further on up to 200 meters if that was what I wanted to do. We pretty much stayed in the 100 meter range with the wickets drills. However, being access, having privy to the material, being diligent about the details. As I said before, his best 100 meter time was 10.73. Eight weeks after our training on the free lap timing gate system, he ran a 10.64. Also during our training, Julius ran some outstanding 60 meter times that would have been indicative of going to the nationals at the indoor. A lot of people didn't believe those times, told me the machine was malfunctioning, but he ran some great times on two separate days. Can't argue with that. But I will say we had a lot of haters. We had a lot of detractors. I told him that that was going to happen. Nevertheless, he went down to Southern Oregon and what happened? Mediocre season. Never ran better than a 10 6 nine. Terrible for his standards. He came back to Portland the summer of 2016, stressed out, frustrated. And angry from a large part in terms of his strength training needs not being met, jump training needs not being met, no systematic programming in that department except for being sent on death marches. And what do I call death marches? Death marches is something that all track coaches in the know will tell you that this is old school philosophy where you're trying to condition the athlete, build up the conditioning base for sprinters, which is an anaerobic activity, but you're sending, sending them on two mile, three mile, four mile, five mile, six mile runs to get them conditioned, basically destroying their anaerobic capacities and putting them in a situation where they're never going to perform to expectation because enough anaerobic activity isn't happening. In the off season, you definitely want to be strength training. You want to be jump training. You want to be doing things that are fast and maybe it should be minimized. When you're talking about getting to your genetic potential, I bet Usain Bolt has never done a five mile or six mile jog, but I digress. Again, you coaches that are sending athletes on those death marches, you're fired. 
your head is metaphorically at the gallows because you're doing your athletes an injustice. You have to do your athletes justice. Coaches, you have to. You have to do your athletes justice. And what, I, what do I mean by justice? I don't have a Webster's Dictionary definition for justice. I don't even have a Google definition for justice. My definition for justice is this. Guaranteeing that no one is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person who needs help the most gets the most constructive help. Now, when I relate that to Julius, if I failed in our training based on his goals and what he want and his diligence to training, that would have been mistreating him. If I failed in his training and not being detailed, he wouldn't have got the most constructive help, period. My intentions were to pay attention to as many details as possible, always timing with the electronic timing gate system, keeping strength and jump training coupled with our sprint training program and always having a camera out there. Now, I'm fortunate enough to have some outstanding mentors in Coach Leon McKenzie and Coach Ronnie Harrison. Coach Harrison was at was the head sprints coach at Portland State University at the time. So oftentimes I could call these two gentlemen, send them footage of our training and get instant feedback within a matter of hours. Great resources, great mentors. Can't speak enough. I bow down to those guys. And the reason why I say that is because they pick up the phone every time I call, even when I ask the same question three or four times over until I can understand what they're talking about. They've had the utmost patience with me. So I had to have that working with Julius. So for me, at the end of the day, I had to implore concepts that I learned from the goldmine effect by Rasmus Ankerson by putting him in conditions where he had to perform under intense pressure and letting him know that numbers drive everything. What you did last year, last month, or last week, it does not matter. It is the new baseline. And I had to hold him brutally accountable for every training session, even on the light days, even on the heavy days, not ducking out, making sure he was getting his treatment, getting the massage therapy and getting the physical therapy when needed and also going to bed early. I told him if you miss once, I'm out because based on your goal, this is going to be a difficult thing to do. I had to keep him pushed by hungry and new competitors. And one of the biggest things that I could say about him, I had to impress upon him that you have to constantly grow and reinvent yourself to stay at the top or get to where you want to be. And for him, he had to reinvent himself by getting stronger. I've often said, and it's always been true for me and my athletes, and this is just based off the squat alone. If your squat goes up, your vertical jump is going to go up. If your vertical jump goes up, that 10 and 30 meter block start is going to come down. And once I proved this to him, I had the utmost trust from him and also his family. Now, some of the things that I can say from training with this young man for the last two to three years has been that I've always noticed that he's always paying attention He is always attentive. We have always been able to connect and talk about what's working and what's not working and make small and subtle adjustments. We've been able to build from one workout to the next. And more importantly, we've been able to build from one conversation to the next. He's always alert. He's always focused. Does he make mistakes sometimes? Yes. Did I make mistakes in some of our training? Of course I did. But we would talk about that and then we would repeat the process for success and take out what didn't work. Who is Julius Schellmeyer? What does he do? What is he about? What makes him special? After coming home from his first year in school and competing at Southern Oregon University, he decided to risk everything and double down and bet on himself by giving the academic and track and field scholarship back to Southern Oregon University and decided to transfer to the University of Oregon. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of stress and and anxiety there. First, he had to get accepted to the University of Oregon. And we're talking about applying to the school late in the summer. Finally got accepted. Then he had to get permission to try out for the team. That finally happened. 
And throughout that summer, we had some training partners that fell off. And what did that cause? A result of us not having the training partners that we had the year before. We didn't have in, as intense as training sessions that I would have liked from a competitive standpoint. So we had some times that were higher than normal, but I had to explain to him, let's keep the goals in orders. Let's have systems and strategies for these setbacks. We have to keep doing our visualizations and we have to keep a positive mental attitude throughout this journey, especially when the part of the journey comes where there's a struggle. So we had some peaks, some valleys, some plateaus, but we were able to get through that. You know, along the journey, there's always going to be some down days. And then on top of that, you have the doubters. You also have the haters. But this gentleman, Julius Schellmeyer, was able to work through all hardship. And what do I mean by that? We had a time on the track. I had some outstanding training plan, some contrast starts for the 30s. And then later we were going to do six to eight 60 meters with the wickets drills. So we get into the middle of the wickets drills after our contrast starts and he tells me that he has to puke. He feels like he has to vomit. So I told him, I'm like, listen, man, whatever you have to do, I suggest you go up there near the uh, portable stalls. And if any of you have been to Grant Park where the track is, you know where those stars are. So you can relive this with me. And I just said, man, just go on up there, put index finger to throw, throw that shit up. And let's get back to work. You got a 10 minute rest to figure this out. You want to go to University of Oregon, right? You want to try out for the team, right? You want to make the team, right? All those were yes. He went and did that. I gave him the foam roller, softball, lacrosse ball, let him roll out for another 10 minutes. And then we got back to work. That was a defining moment because he could have walked away or I could have walked away. But that was a defining moment for him. It was a defining moment for me because I challenged him and he didn't see that coming. Honestly, I didn't see it coming. It was just a reaction. As I said, I'm a reader. I think I was reading Relentless by Tim Grover at the time. So I was, I was disciplining myself more. And he mentioned a statement like that in his book, Training Athletes, I want to say down in Houston. So it just kind of came out. He went through up and got back to work. That's Julius Schellmeyer working through all hardship, working through frustration, working through doubters, working through haters, working through the frenemies, people that say they support you, but really hate on you behind the scenes. Who is Julius Schellmeyer? What is he about? What makes him special? Where is he at now? He made the team at the University of Oregon, currently on the four by 100 team to date. They've broke three school records and getting ready for the nationals. I asked him in a questionnaire what his first year was like at the University of Oregon. And he explained to me that when he got to school, he was surprised at the number of kids that wind up in classes where he was in classes, sitting in auditoriums with upwards over 100 students in each class. Before he could fall off, he decided to get a tutor and his grades have always remained up because he decided early on to figure out the balance between school and track. He also stated in the questionnaire that he didn't talk much going out to the early practices. Even though the teammates were friendly, they embraced him. He can now say that they're brothers. He just, he explained to me that he would just put his head down and go to work day after day after day. And I remember one particular phone call in the preseason when school started where he ran like the third best 30 meter meter block start time. And they had about 15 sprinters out there at the time. And he, and he had the third best time. He called me excited. And the only thing I could say is that I told you things will get a lot better once you were down there with serious and hungry competitors. My goal at the time was to get him down in good company because I've heard nothing but good things about the head sprints coach at the University of Oregon. I knew once he got down there, he would be in great hands. So we talked for about an hour last week. And, you know, the interesting thing about it is I didn't want to talk about track and field. I didn't want to talk about strength training. I didn't want to talk about sprint training based on where he's at right now. It was time for us to go deeper. So the conversation was only fitting that we began to discuss legacy, vision, and mindset. And what I mean by legacy is I was explaining to him, how do you want to be remembered? 
for the future generations that come to the University of Oregon. How do you want to be remembered as a student? How do you want to be remembered as an athlete? What are the things that you do day to day that you want to be remembered for? What are the habits that you want to be remembered for? How are you going to help people? You know, so I want my challenge to him to start now and define his legacy, not concerned with goals. The next thing we talked about was vision. The goal is one thing. That's just a destination. But the vision is what does it look like? How do you see yourself getting there? Who's helping you along the way? Who are you helping along the way? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Those are things that we discussed. And outside of that, the last one was mindset. Because I explained to him, you have to have a mindset that has systems and strategies in place for not only mistakes and failures, but more importantly, success. And what do I mean by that? I have a phrase called success intoxication. What is success intoxication? Sometimes you can achieve success early on or you can achieve some excess that you didn't plan for and you might not know how to respond to it. And oftentimes you've seen this done over and over throughout this history of sports is people being successful early or just having no understanding how to handle success. What what happens They get arrogant. They become overconfident. They stop working. They start coming late to practice. They stop having intense practices. They begin to come hot dogs. They begin to think that they're special. And what generally happens, they make a series of amateurish moves that takes them out of the game quicker than they got there. So I wanted to impress upon him, be wary of success intoxication. You will miss that if you understand your legacy, define that legacy. Let's look at your vision and have a mindset in place, systems and strategies in place to not only handle your failures, mistakes and shortcomings, but also success. Because we still have two years to go at the University of Oregon and what can happen in the year 2020. You might be invited to the Olympic trials. That conversation is neither here nor there. But at the end of the day, I wanted to give credit to a young man who works his butt off in the classroom, who works his butt off on the track and who works his butt off in the weight room. I mean, this is one of the most diligent, hardworking student athletes that I've ever worked with. None. I don't gas people up. I don't dress things up. This is the hundred percent truth right here. He did the work. What I can say is I I give a lot of credit to Coach Leon McKenzie. I give a lot of credit to Coach Ronnie Harrison, who was at PSU at the time. Now he's the head sprints coach at the University of Oklahoma. These are two guys that will always accept my phone calls. I had an opportunity to just go shadow Coach Harrison a lot while he was at PSU. I would just drive down, come out with my cameras, come out with my notepad and just watch him work, ask questions. And I was fortunate enough the team felt comfortable with me to let me hang out with them and hang out with Coach Harrison and watch him do his work where I was able to learn a lot of material when it comes to sprint training, working with the 100 meter, 200 meter sprinter. Can't stress it enough. Outside of that, I know Latif Thomas in the Boston area has some tremendous sprint training material. Rest in peace to Charlie Francis, his weights for speed program and information is tremendous. And you can never go wrong when it comes to strength training and the conjugate method with Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell. The other guy who I incorporated, borrowed is Kyle Dietz and his triphasic training system. For me, we were always living somewhere between the Westside Barbell conjugate method and Kyle Dietz triphasic training. And it seemed to work. In fact, it worked for sure. So one thing I want to remind you of again in the show notes, I will have a PDF available for 72 hours. My PDF in ebook breaking the speed barrier. This is a product that's for sale. It will be for sale in the future. But right now for you, if you want to learn more about some of the things that I was working with, with Julius and a couple other athletes while they were training with me and things that I still do, I would suggest you download that. Outside of that, if you have questions, comments, concerns, topics that you would want to hear more of, 
people you would like for me to interview or people that you suggest that I reach out to, don't hesitate. You can reach out to me at Deshaun, that's D-E-S-H-A-W-N at sportsmastery.com. I hope y'all have really enjoyed this presentation. This presentation is for the parent-athlete combination. It is for the coach-athlete combination. Didn't mean to touch any nerves. Didn't mean to pull any teeth. Sometimes I get emotional when I see certain coaches treat certain athletes and they don't pull the best out of them. I love what I do. I wish that everybody carried that same approach. Outside of that, if you're a parent listening to this, our Sports Mastery Mastermind group is coming forward. You can learn more about that at sportsmastery.com slash mastermind. This is something that I'm coming out with down the line. That's not only for the student, it's also for the athlete and the coach, depending on what that combination is at that time. But we have a mastermind group that is about everyone getting better, everyone being heard, and me sharing my concepts and principles in a group setting to reach out and help more people. Again, if you want to reach out to me, don't hesitate. Deshaun at sportsmastery.com. Peace and blessings.